Okay, welcome everyone um, to this series of webinars that is being organized by the Repressibility Initiative at SC22. Today we are going to have Jetstream 2, um, which is a, an evolution of the original Jetstream system and Jeremy Fisher is going to be presenting today um, how can we use Jetstream uh, to accelerate computing on the cloud. Um, the SC22 Reproducibility Initiative Committee is made out of multiple people and multiple subgroups. Uh, I just want to acknowledge them uh, right now um, because this is a collective effort and we want to make sure that um, everyone gets the, their recognition. So um, before we start, I also want to remind everyone of the SC22 deadlines. The paper abstract is going to be on March 25th and the full paper is going to be April 1st. But for the artifact description and artifact, artifact evaluation, you're gonna have a little bit more time. The artifact description is going to be mandatory. It means that every publication in supercomputing will require an, uh, an artifact description. And that is for April 15th. And for the artifact evaluation, it is optional, but it is highly recommended. If you want to see uh, examples on submission forms, or if you want to know uh, what information is required, you can always visit this link over here. Um, the idea of the Reproducibility Initiative Committee is to be able to enhance scientific rigor and increase transparency in supercomputing. And it is not just the idea of having artifact description and artifact evaluation in the papers, but it's a set of activities that happen during supercomputing and around um, around the year where we try to uh, encourage authors to reproduce results and also increase uh, publications that come after a um, after the publication of the original work so uh, the artifact description artifact evaluation uh, committee is in charge of uh, making sure that the papers get submitted with artifact description and the and the papers can actually uh, request different badges um, to be used in, in their publication. So there is the artifact available badge, the artifacts evaluated and functional badge, and the results reproduced. Um, so you don't have to have all the badges. Um, you can always select which badges you want to, to use. For example, if you cannot share the artifact, then you can uh, opt out on the artifact availability, but then uh, you can always do results reproduce or artifact evaluation, a evaluated functional. A, the other part is the reproducibility challenge where we take a paper from a previous year. Um, we try, we, we give it to student uh, closer competition for them to, uh, to reproduce re the result. And based on that, um, based on the student's report, we have a journal special issue activity where we try to encourage them to uh, publish new papers based on that and collaborate with the authors to, to publish new papers for next year. And um, this year we also have the, the award, the Best Reproducibility Advancement Award that is based on the artifact description and artifact evaluation. And that will, be, that will get a recognition during the conference. So we have had multiple webinars in the past. We did uh, one on, um, we, we did one with Chameleon, we did another one um, with the University of Oregon. And today we are going to have one with Jetstream. And uh, if you want to take a look at the recordings from previous webinars, you can always visit these uh, links. So the idea here is that a Jetstream is a cloud resource that is part of the National Science Foundation. And that this project tries to accelerate and, and improve access of on-demand infrastructure for the different universities and for the different sites in the US. Um, it is an evolution of the previous Jetstream platform, so new features, and we are gonna be able to see what those new features are. And it is infrastructure as a service, meaning that you will be requesting the different services that you have. Um, the idea of this presentation is to show lessons learned, to understand how to use the resources and to understand how to um, use those resources in the context of SC22 uh, artifact, artifact description and artifact evaluation. So I'm going to invite Jeremy to share his screen and start the presentation right now. All right, thank you very much. Let me get my screen shared. Oh good, it's changed. 
All right. Do we have the correct slides up this time? No, we don't. We have, <laughs> uh, yeah, you're getting my. Yeah, we're getting into it. Ah, great. Let's swap displays. How about now? Perfect. Um, Excellent. I mean, it is white. I don't know if, if the first slide is. On I, the... I, yeah, I just didn't know if you're getting my presenter view. I, I'm just looking at a white screen. So. Oh. Okay, let's try it again. Oh. It uh, there we go. Better. Yeah, presenter slides. <laughs> of course. Uh, if you if you put the use slideshow, it will work. If you click on the use slideshow, it should work. Okay. Click on it. I see on the top. Uh. On the top le left. Oh, gotcha. No. no and happened? screen sharing just went away. Hang on. Let's try that again. How about now? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, Zoom uh, is always fun. It worked a second ago in test, and of course, as we come here, it, it didn't. Um, so I'm Jeremy Fisher. I am a manager of Jetstream Cloud and now Jetstream 2. Uh, we are at Indiana University, but we're a National Science Foundation project. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about Jetstream 2 and how it will relate to uh, the reproducibility efforts uh, that for supercomputing. So a little bit about Jetstream. Um, we are in uh, a second uh, five-year grant based on Jetstream 1. Um, we are adding uh, resources to the national cyber infrastructure. Uh, we're a little different than most in that we're adding a, a cloud resource as opposed to HPC resources like you typically find. Um, but it, it's a definite uh, addition to the national cyber infrastructure and that it gives something a little bit different and hopefully uh, fills a gap in that uh, a lot of people are needing. So a little bit about where we came from. So Jetstream 1 uh, was running and is still running now for a little over five years. Uh, it's due to go offline uh, in coming months. Um, but with the things that we found that worked uh, were allowing a, a fully managed uh, infrastructure. So users had root access to their VMs. They basically could do anything they needed to do, uh, installs and otherwise. Um, indefinite workflows. So as long as you had an allocation, um, and allocations are free via Exceed, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, you could run as long as the system was up. Um, so we've literally had allocations that have been running on Jetstream since 2016 when we came online production um, and are still running today and will be transitioning to Jetstream too soon. Uh, the other thing that really worked for us was development of trial allocations. And the thing that really worked for us there was that due to the way the rules work with Exceed and soon to be Access, um, or at least we assume they're going to be the same with Access, uh, PI eligibility is based on being faculty or staff at a US-based US research institution, um, which meant that while students could use the system, they couldn't be PIs and get their own allocations. So they could come in and get a trial allocation, try the system out, uh, show their mentor or, or uh, instructor you know, how this could fit into their workflows. And often that was uh, the stepping stone to bringing new research groups and new education groups uh, to the cloud. Uh, the things that didn't work, um, forcing small allocations into the research process. If you're not familiar with Exceed, um, there's different levels of allocations. There's startup education research allocations. Um, research allocations are not limited. Uh, you can literally get millions and millions of core hours, but it means going basically to a review committee. And so for smaller groups that basically just needed a handful of hours, uh, they weren't used to doing that sort of uh, rigorous proposal writing and it, it caused some issues that I think it kept some folks out of the research process that could have really benefited from it. Um, so we're seeing some changes there uh, with Exceed and, and hopefully with Access as well. Uh, lack of multi-year allocations, this is something that's also changing uh, to see allocations that span from year to year, hopefully to meet multi-year grant needs. And then lack of uh, shared data set storage. So one of the things we were hobbled by with Jetstream 1 was a lack of storage space. And as we all know, storage needs never ever go down. Uh, so on Jetstream 2, we, we have considerably more storage. Uh, so some of the lessons learned, again, uh, larger larger storage pools. Uh, I'll show the sizes of those, but we're basically going from uh, two terabytes or two petabytes total on Jetstream 1 with a petabyte usable uh, to 
one, I believe, petabytes uh, in Jetstream 2. Um, so it's making a, a very large difference. Um, a difference in hardware. So we're going from an all CPU system uh, to a CPU and GPU system. Um, we're taking those GPUs and, and using uh, either MIG or vGPU and, and slicing them up a little bit to give uh, slices of GPUs to as many people as we can. So you can get everything from a seventh of a GPU up to a full GPU. Um, if you use Jetstream 1, you probably noticed there were there were two interfaces and never the twain shall meet. So you had allocation or you had uh, resources that use the atmosphere side, and then you had uh, researchers that use the API side, but you couldn't control uh, the, the resources from, from each side. So if you used atmosphere, you were only siloed in atmosphere. If you used the API, you were only siloed in the API. Jetstream 2 is actually breaking down those walls. So you can use any interface to control any resource you want on Jetstream, on Jetstream 2. Um, just other uh, improvements to our infrastructure, um, basically just trying to make things as simple and as fast and performant for the users as possible. So primarily what users are gonna see, researchers will see uh, larger nodes. Uh, so we're based on uh, the AMD Milan chips. Uh, so 128 cores uh, per node. Um, the smallest memory node is 512 gigs. Uh, we also have uh, large memory nodes that go up to a terabyte. And then, as I mentioned before, uh, A100s that are basically sliced and diced up uh, via vGPU or MIG uh, to give anything from a seventh to a full GPU. This is a high level look at what Jetstream 2 looks like. So we have the primary cloud at Indiana University. Um, that's where the bulk of the computing is. As you can see, uh, 416 compute nodes um, and then 90 accelerator nodes, each with four GPUs. And then we have four regional clouds presently. And so these are our Jetstream 2 partners uh, that are hosting small deployments of Jetstream 2 locally um, as test beds and basically local resources for their researchers. And part of the appeal with Jetstream 2 is also that we can add other sites that wish to come into the Jetstream 2 fold. Um, we've actually already started talking with one group uh, that is potentially interested and we haven't even gone production yet. So we're hoping to see other folks come in. And what they get from this is a shared uh, environment of uh, allocations of user management and of uh, application management. So um, hopefully we give folks uh, a reason to come under this umbrella and expand the Jetstream 2 structure. So capabilities, um, we're improving uh, orchestration support over Jetstream 1. So in Jetstream 1, we started seeing things like uh, Apache Mesos and, and of course Kubernetes. Um, we're bringing that a little bit more into the forefront with Jetstream 2. Um, part of that will be capabilities provided by the OpenStack uh, cloud management system that Jetstream 2 uses. Um, part of that will be through external tools like, uh, you know, that folks are familiar for familiar with already from uh, the Kubernetes development people. Um, but it's, it's providing a little better support for that out of the gate. Uh, elastic virtual clusters, so Slurm-based virtual clusters are a, a push button uh, deployment in Exosphere presently. Um, it's, it's one of the experimental features, but we're bringing that in, in for production. Um, so if you have a need for a small Slurm cluster, uh, you can pretty easily launch one. Federated Jupyter Hub, so providing a nice way to allow uh, education groups or research groups to use uh, a shared set of credentialing for Jupyter Hubs. Uh, typically, it's going to go through, I believe, through Globus, um, but allow institution-based credentials or Google-based credentials or whatever credentials you choose. Um, and the team working on that is going to have that ready for usage very soon. Um, CephFS with Manila is uh, basically one of the biggest requests we had with Jetstream 1 was I wanted I want to share data between my research group on different VMs and it pretty much meant that you had to know how to be a network file system administrator um, and, and that was a, a, a hurdle for a lot of folks um, so with Jetstream 2 we're using Manila which is file systems as a service uh, under OpenStack and allow people to have they're basically managed NFS shares uh, that you can easily mount between virtual machines. So you don't actually have to manage the NFS portion. You just tell OpenStack uh, how big of a share you want and what kind of access rules you want to it. And then you can mount it uh, on other VMs. Um, again, from Jetstream 1, uh, we are committed to uptime. So 
uh, the, the IU cloud basically never goes offline. Uh, we do maintenance and rolling waves uh, in, in hopes that we never have a, a real outage. Um, we've had some issues with networks in the past, um, which is kind of outside our, outside of our control, but generally we don't have downtime and we're hoping to continue that with Jetstream 2. Um, and that's, uh, again, critical for researchers. It's critical for infrastructure uh, allocations. Um, but it also is just a, it's a good practice. And you can do that with cloud systems uh, as it makes it easy to migrate people from uh, hypervisor to hypervisor, hopefully invisibly. Um, again, changing our user interfaces. We're going to talk about Exosphere today, which is our primary user interface with Jetstream 2. Um, I'm hoping to have enough time to, to kind of give you a quick walkthrough of it. Um, but it's a little different from our atmosphere interface on Jetstream 1, but still the goal is the same, which is to make it so researchers uh, or students can come in and easily get going without having to, a, a giant learning curve uh, for learning how to use the resource. So to talk a little bit about allocations, I mentioned before that uh, everything is allocated via Exceed and it'll soon be Access, uh, which is, those are both National Science Foundation projects. Um, it's part of the Jetstream 2 uh, Track 2 uh, grants or all of the, the Track 2 grants that basically you will integrate with Exceed and whatever comes after. Um, and that gives a nice central place for uh, user management and it gives a place for resource management uh, and documentation and support. So it's a, a nice centralized virtual organization that lets you, uh, lets the researchers have one place where they can get access to all the resources they need. And it also makes it easier for the actual service providers and that uh, a lot of the things like user management and, and document management and support are all kind of based in one place. So it's something that uh, helps the entire community as a whole. Um, but as mentioned, uh, we have different kinds of allocations. Most people coming in will get a startup allocation and these this shows the limits. You can think of SUs, those are service units, um, which is the currency of Exceed. Um, for Jetstream 2, a service unit is a core hour. That's how you can think about it. It's a very simple thing with a complicated name. So uh, you can get up to 200,000 core hours uh, and uh, on the CPU side, 400,000 on large memory, 600,000 on GPUs um, fairly easily. Uh, startup generally takes a paragraph or two of information on what you're gonna do with the system, uh, sharing any grant information. Uh, grants are not required by the way, um, but sharing information about what you're doing um, and then uh, we get you access. And the link right there uh, has uh, the two links on the page have information both about the resources that are available and then also about how you actually get an application. And then the last bit is uh, talking about the best practice for uh, supercomputing reproducibility. And this is a couple of things that we had talked about uh, previously, um, whether it would make sense for uh, researchers or, or people that are doing some of the reproducibility testing to get their own startups or to have a discretionary uh, allocation that our PI could authorize. And that basically whoever is managing this effort could add, uh, add researchers to as needed. Um, I personally think that the discretionary is probably the best way to do it as it would be less overhead for uh, the team that manages this. Um, but that's something that we should probably talk about going forward as we get closer to, uh, to supercomputing and to the review process. But I wanted to give you the overview on, on what's available, which is typically a startup uh, for these sorts of things. Um, and even students could come in via the trial allocations as well. But um, as, we, as we move forward, we should uh, discuss what will best suit the needs of the team of, of researchers that are going to be reviewing papers and doing reproducibility testing. So a quick look at the flavors. If you've uh, ever used any of the commercial clouds, this will look familiar. Um, it's not revolutionary here. We have a nice array of, of VM sizes from one core up to 128. Um, and then up from three gig of RAM up to 500 gig of RAM on the regular side. And then on large memory up to a terabyte. Uh, you can kind of see how we slice and dice the GPUs up here as well. Uh, it has, there's a, a reference link for uh, information about the NVIDIA side of things. And then at the bottom, you can see where this, uh, this page data actually comes from, and you can review that on your own as well. These do evolve over time, but this is generally what we expect to see for the life of Jetstream 2. 
So how do I access Jetstream 2? So today there are three primary interfaces, there are three interfaces for accessing Jetstream 2. Uh, there will soon be a fourth. Um, there's the Exosphere interface, which is on the left-hand side of the screen. It's the primary GUI interface. Uh, it's meant to be very user-friendly. It's meant to be the most accessible way to get to Jetstream 2. Um, there's the Horizon interface, which is in kind of the lower right side, which is also a GUI. It's provided by OpenStack. It's the OpenStack native interface. Um, it's usable. Uh, it, it has full featured uh, access. So that everything that uh, a researcher can do is exposed in, in Horizon. It's not terribly user friendly. It's not intuitive and it's not the fastest. Um, it's provided as a means because there's some things that sometimes if you want particular advanced functionality, you might have to come to that interface. And then lastly is the command line interface, which is uh, the green window in the upper right. Um, and so that's an interface that uh, tends to be more of the power users. Um, it's folks that either want to do things in a, in a scripted way or that uh, or just used to living in the command line. Um, and then attached to the command line interface is also there's an SDK as well, which is Python based. Um, it uses all the same uh, basic calls as the command line, but it lets you do things in a little more programmatic way. Um, at the end of the talk, I'm going to show you Exosphere a little bit and show some of the features there. Um, but again, down at the bottom, there's a, a reference link that uh, takes you to a little bit about Jetstream 2 and, and uh, an overview of the interfaces. So using and preserving virtual machines. Um, one of the things, like I mentioned before, is you have root access. So you can install just about anything you want. Um, it needs to be Linux based. And, and I've got some caveats here. Um, there's the standard warning about licensed software, uh, which is if it's something that uh, is licensed and limited restricted use, it is up to uh, you as a researcher to, to make sure that the world can't access things that they don't need to access. Um, and then as Linux, um, Windows will have a presence on Jetstream 2. It is not our primary uh, operating system. It's... I hate to say it's sort of marginally supported because we have no Windows experts on staff, although we all try. Um, Windows will be there as an experimental thing. Um, we generally encourage using Linux versions of, of software wherever possible. Um, sharing things is a little different on Jetstream 2. On Jetstream 1 with Atmosphere, you had an imaging process. It was uh, simple for the users. It was complicated under the hood. Uh, Jetstream 2 is, is going with snapshotting, which is an OpenStack uh, feature uh, where basically you literally take a snapshot of the virtual machine at that moment in time, and then you can share it with your allocation or with other allocations. So again, it's fairly easy to share a, a snapshot. Um, we don't allow them to go public by default, uh, so there's a little bit of added protection in there if you have things that are uh, sensitive in the sense that you don't want them out. We still, in terms of sensitive data, we do, do not allow EPHI on Jetstream 2. Uh, that's an exceed rule as well. Um, but if you have things that are papers that are just not ready for general consumption yet and data sets that may not be ready for general consumption yet, uh, snapshotting by default is limited to your allocation uh, and only is explicitly shareable either uh, by you explicitly sharing it with somebody or asking us to make it public. So there's a little bit of uh, safety there. Um, and then as far as using an, uh, the VMs themselves and, and doing workflows, a general practice is, is usually pulling down from Git or pulling a container. Um, and there's also one that uh, I'm going to show you at the end of the talk, uh, which is an experimental feature in Exosphere, uh, but will be part of the production uh, installation on Jetstream 2, which is using workflows from my binder. Um, they actually have that uh, built into Exosphere. And so you can give it uh, the URL of your project in my binder, and it will actually bring that in as part of the, uh, the virtual machine build process. So that's another workflow recommendation that we're doing is if, if, you, if you are using my binder, Exosphere makes it very easy to bring those in. A little bit about the timeline. Um, so Jetstream 1 is, uh, is in sunset. Um, we expect it to go offline in coming months. Uh, we are officially ending production at the end of this month. However, um, because there are courses on it, we're going to run through uh, the end of the semester. 
Um, we're not going to bring in new allocations on it or uh, allow you know any additions to the to the system. Um, Jetstream two is in early operations right now. Um, we continue in early operations until our National Science Foundation review. Um, we hope that uh, all will go well there and we will be in production at the end of April, 2022. Um, we are not anticipating any issues there uh, so far. Uh, this is a little, some acknowledgements of our awards. Again, we are a National Science Foundation project. So these are our awards there and we would like to thank them for their support. Um, and then a few folks from our team. Our Jetstream 2 partners. And we are at the end of the slideshow. Um, so if there are any questions before I show you Exosphere, uh, please let's, uh, let's get those now and then uh, I will show Exosphere. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. I had a question regarding access for the reviewers. So let's say that I apply for an allocation as an author. Now okay. I want to share that allocation with a reviewer so they can do it. You mentioned the possibility of sharing the image, but how do we do about sharing the, the account or the or the general allocation? Or do you think that it would be possible to have an allocation for supercomputing? I think it would be very possible to have an allocation for supercomputing. In fact, that's that's kind of what I would recommend. Um, we had talked about it last year, and I don't know that it actually gained any traction. Um, but I would recommend that uh, we work that uh, who, if I'm assuming it's going to be you or, or somebody else on the team, um, we work together with our PI to get a, a what's called a discretionary allocation, um, which is uh, an allocation at the PI's discretion, which we are allowed to do by National Science Foundation rules um, up to a certain percentage of the system. Um, so I would I would recommend getting a discretionary allocation, and then as researchers and reviewers uh, come to the system, basically to uh, either you know share their their uh, artifacts or have them reviewed. Um, they would create an exceed account and then um, whoever is managing the allocation, which could be a combination of, of your team and our team, um, can add the, the researchers and reviewers to the allocation. Um, and then they would have access to the allocation, be able to launch VMs and launch images as they need to. What about if the reviewers are um, not in the US? Uh, reviewers not being in the US is fine. Um, the, only, the only restriction on, on allocations is the PI must be US based. Users can be anywhere in the world as long as they're not in one of the uh, sanctioned countries, which there are only four at present. So um, uh, as long as they're not coming from, unfortunately, Iran is one of them. Um, I, I'd have to look at the list, but we have four uh, ITAR sanctioned countries that are not allowed access to Jetstream. Um, but other than that, uh, researchers can be anywhere in the world, world to use Jetstream. Excellent. Uh, Rocio has a question. Sure. Yes, thank you. So I have a question regarding the timeline. Timeline. Maybe I have misunderstood it. Can we go back to that slide to check again? Because um, I would like to, to make sure that we have uh, full coverance during the whole review process for the reviewers to start and then continue until the end of August or maybe September, depending on the- Oh, right, right, right. Um, so the timeline is, you know, we're, we're in early operations presently, but we, we have researchers on the system where we, we're considering early operations production. Um, it's not, there's a National Science Foundation has some terminology for it. We are not considered in production until we have met uh, their acceptance panel review. However, we are going to be up and running from now through, well, hopefully for the next 10 years, um, without any issue. So I don't, I don't foresee any problems with, with meeting your timelines and needs. Okay. Okay. Just to be sure, because I saw uh, April there and I was a bit concerned about it. Thank you right. very much. <laughs> yeah. Right. We're, we're, like I said, we're in early operations presently, um, which is basically that nebulous area of we are running right now. We have research groups on the system. Um, but we are not considered production by the National Science Foundation until after the review panel. Um, like I said, we're not anticipating any issues there. We, we've done this before. Um, and so we're, we feel fairly confident that we're going to meet all of the requirements and then some, um, and then we'll be in full blown operations, you know, regular production, uh, like I said, for, for the next five to 10 years. So 
I, I, I don't foresee any issues with it. Oh, great. So if, if, a, if a, an author wants to apply for an allocation and they don't have a PI yet, they don't have um, anybody on the team, how long does it take for the whole process to go through so they can plan ahead? Typically, we tell people um, for, out, for a startup allocation uh, that it's one to two business days. Uh, the reality is it's usually much faster. Um, there is a crack review panel for startup allocations. That's me. Um, and I try to review those on a daily basis. Um, typically, the, the problem comes down to uh, once I submit it, depending what time it is in the day, we're all on uh, everybody on, on the allocations team is Eastern time. So if something comes in at four o'clock, you know, it, it will probably not be handled until the next day by the allocations folks. Um, and then when, even once it's approved, there's a up to a four hour window where all the systems sync up. Um, but we typically tell people to start up one to two business days. Excellent. Do we have any more questions? All right, if there are no more questions and, and if you have other questions you think of as we go, please do speak up. Um, I'm gonna show our uh, the Exosphere screen then and kind of give you a quick look at, at the Exosphere interface for Jetstream 2. If I can find my share button again, here it is. This one should hopefully go easier because it's a single browser window. Uh, <laughs> all right, so is everybody seeing my Exosphere screen? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. So this is a, when you, when you land on Exosphere, the first time you come in, it'll, it'll ask you to authenticate. Obviously I've already done that. Um, it's, it's authenticating through uh, Globus through exceed. So it's using exceed credentials. So one less password you have to remember, which is good. Um, but you will see when you get to, to the home screen, you see your allocations. Um, so I'm going to take a look at uh our test allocation. So this is our Jetstream 2 staff allocation. This dashboard kind of shows you what you have in use. So uh, I have I have one instance that I've launched and then there's 10 other instances in the allocation. You can see volumes, you can see the public IP addresses in use. Um, you can see your SSH keys, um, but it, it basically gives you a nice look, uh, an overview of, of what's here. So we're gonna look at an instance. So this is one that I had launched uh, on Friday just to have ready. So when you come into the dashboard for it, you can just get, again, uh, an overview of what's in use so you can see how busy your VM is. Thankfully, this one is not busy um, because <laughs> I'm the one who's launched it. I'm the only one who has access. And if it was really busy, I'd be concerned. Um, but you have different uh, ways of accessing. So you can see a web shell. You can see a web desktop. You can see the console. Um, we're going to take a look at the console just because it is literally uh, the, the Linux console, which is apparently asleep. Come on. Okay, it's apparently not waking up. Awesome. So the first time I ever did a National Science Foundation presentation, uh, I was pretty green at it and I did a live demo. And afterwards uh, they all said, that was very brave of you to do a live demo because nothing ever works right when you do a live demo. And I was dumb enough to not know that uh, I shouldn't have done a live demo. So anyway, uh, in, the, in the grand tradition of live demos, the console is not working. Let's, let's see about the web shell. Uh, okay, ah, here we go. So we are in, um, you know, we're just any other user and we can be root as we would anywhere. Um, it's easy, it's simple, it's all contained in the web browser. Uh, so you don't have to install other tools if you don't want to. Um, there, you can do everything you could normally do as a general user from the web shell. Um, you can also SSH into it directly, uh, which is a nice feature. There, there are people that like both methods of access. So there are folks that like just using the web shell. There are folks that feel more comfortable in their own terminals. We try to accommodate all of that. The web desktop also uh, should get you a, a nice GUI version. There we go. Um, so you can launch anything you want here. Um, I, I presently don't have many apps installed on this uh, just because I was just using as a demo. But typically what we see a lot of people using the GUI desktop for, especially things like MATLAB that are uh, GUIs with interactive components. Our studio is a big one that uh, people like to use from a, from a desktop. But this gives you a nice way that you can have the GUI component if you need to have it for something. Um, again, there's uh, 
basically just some information about it. You can attach a volume if you needed additional storage space. Um, it tells you a little bit about what's been going on with your instance, et cetera. Um, but one of the things I wanted to show you was creating an instance. So you come here, you hit, sorry, I, I kind of went fast. So you hit create an instance and it brings you here to pick the image you wanna use. And we've tried to make this process easy. Um, you can pick it from a tile, you can pick it from a list, um, but this is the default that people use. It's kind of module, modeled after uh, DigitalOcean a little bit. Um, so you, we uh, grab a, an Ubuntu 20, we give it a descriptive name, and then we can pick our flavor out. But the thing that's interesting on it is I've enabled the experimental workflows. So for instance, as I was mentioning, if you have uh, a, a get or, or binder uh, workflow that you wanna bring in, um, or a Docker file, um, you can basically put in the URL here, uh, you can give it any of the metadata it needs and uh, and launch it. And that will be pulled in uh, when you launch your instance. So that, um, that means that if you have, if you are a reviewer and you have a Docker image from a, an author that comes from a different cloud, you can just point to the Docker repository and... You can point to the, the yeah, you yeah. can point to the Docker file. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, assuming everything is in a perfect world and nothing will break, but <laughs> <laughs> but you know, assuming assuming the 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 Docker file builds on its own outside of Jetstream, it, it should work just work here. Um, you know, it, it in a perfect world, you know, there's there's always things that go wrong, but if you can go to that repository and and build the container from that Docker file today, it should just work as part of the workflow. Um, and, and as you know, if, if I'm, I'm over the tooltip right now, any binder compatible repository uh, can be launched. So uh, there's the reference to mybinder.org. Um, this has been one of the things that the Exosphere maintainers have been very passionate about is, is integrating easier workflow uh, recipes, is I guess the right way to put it, into Exosphere to make it easy for researchers uh, to, to come in and basically point to their repo, point to their MyBinder project, and just have it integrated from the start, um, trying to make things a little easier. So basically, um, and then you can also uh, enable web desktop, but uh, basically this is what I wanted to show you with the advanced features. And, and this to me is a, a real selling point because uh, pretty much everybody today is, is using uh, some sort of Git repo or Docker repo or MyBinder um, as, as a means of managing their project, project. So this to me is a real selling point for uh, folks that are reviewing and or creating artifacts. Okay. Um, so basically that was the, the quick run through of Exosphere that I wanted to do. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And if there are any other questions, uh, I would love to address them. I had another question. Uh, I pr you probably mentioned this, but I uh, I missed it. Is it running on bare metal or is it running on a VM? And how about sharing resources with other people running on the same system? Okay, so uh, everything is virtual machines. Um, so we're all hypervisor based. Um, there is the possibility for bare metal, but uh, basically people are going to have to really justify their need for, for bare metal to, to get access to it. Um, we've really only had one use case in five years where people really justified why they need bare metal. Um, the, the difference, the loss in performance is not enough to, to justify it. And if your code is, is that, uh, speed dependent or, or, uh, IO dependent, you probably should be using a, a different resource anyway than a cloud resource. Uh, you know, it's uh, we're, we're geared for certain things and high. And while we are a, a considered a high performance resource, it's not the same, obviously, as a high performance computing system. Um, as for sharing, um, so either you can share through sharing an image and people can launch their own, or if you have a virtual machine, uh, you can create an account and have other people use it just like any other Unix machine. So since you have root, um, in fact, we have instructions in the, in the wiki for folks that are not familiar with it um, on just running ad user and, and how to bring them in. 
but by sharing, I mean that the fact that we are running on a VM, so there may be multiple VMs running on the same hardware. Mm -hmm. uh, will there be collision of the workloads? No, it shouldn't be. Um, while while you potentially have uh, the the possibility for somebody using a large chunk of the machine and potentially impacting performance, we don't see it very often because quite often the the folks that are doing larger scale. Uh, computation. So on Jetstream 1, that generally meant either 24 or 44 cores, um, usually had significant parts of a hypervisor to themselves. If you had a 44 core, you had a whole node to yourself. Here, if you have 128 cores, you will have a whole node to yourself. Um, if you're using smaller workloads, uh, typically the, the interrupts are, are enough that one person, one researcher does not impact another researcher. Um, it is it is possible, and if we've had rare cases over the last five years where it's been noticeable, um, and typically what we do is we migrate them to another host. Um, it's easy enough to do, and it happens behind the scenes. Um, we move we move virtual machines around all the time, and people have no idea that it's happening because live migration um, literally keeps everything plumbed up between. So it goes and creates an exact copy, and then redirects you over and at worst, you have to hit return again in your SSH connection to see that there was even a stutter. Um, so it's not something we anticipate being a problem. Um, if you do see a performance hit, uh, then you just uh, touch base with the support folks and, and we we migrate you. Excellent. I'm going to repeat a question that Veronica did before. Um, what about connection to, to big data sources? So there are these <clears throat> endpoints for uh, data that can be a hundred terabytes or more or things like that. Do you have, do you know what the bandwidth is coming into the IO and uh, do you have direct connections to those? Yes, so uh, coming into IU, as long as you're coming from uh, another research institution, we're connected over I2 um, and it's I believe a single 100 gigabit connection now, and it's uh, planned to be a dual 100 gigabit connection. Um, it may already be uh, to, to the machine room itself. Um, and then from Jetstream 2, presently um, we're dual 40s. We're gonna be uh, dual 100s up to there uh, in coming months. We're waiting on a network update at the present. It should be coming hopefully soon, um, mostly waiting for network hardware like most of the world. Um, but it shouldn't be an issue to transfer around large data sets. Um, now, coming from uh, commercial internet is a different issue. Um, you know, I know lots of people are working from home, working off site. Um, there is a noticeable speed difference between commodity internet and research internet. Um, and so we generally uh, recommend uh, that for general purpose usage, you know, coming in via SSH, doing typical workloads, commodity internet's just fine. You're not going to see any difference. When you're transferring large amounts of data, if you're doing it via commodity internet, it's going to be a significantly slower uh, proposition than coming in over the I2 networks. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, this, this was definitely really useful. Um, if we don't have any more questions from the audience, then I think, uh, and if Jeremy doesn't have anything else to, <laughs> to share with us, then I think this will be uh, the end of it. So I, I really thank you, Jeremy, for taking the, the time to um, introduce in Jetstream. I think this was really useful. And I'm really glad with the resources that are available. Um, seems like a really good way of accessing HPC uh, right now. So uh, unless somebody else has something else, um, I will stop the recording now.